Welcome to Prime Cuts number 24 for this May 1st, 2018. On this edition of Prime Cuts, we'll review the 2018 Tobacconist Association of America TAA exclusive releases. Um, and we will also discuss some of the recent announcements concerning the IPCPR. And this episode of Prime Cuts is sponsored, as always, by Lane Coffee. Lane Coffee is for those who actually care about what coffee they drink. Just like with cigars, there is quality versus quantity, and both have their place. But Lane Coffee believes in quality. Roasted fresh in individual batches using 100% specialty coffee from responsible sources. Visit them on the web at www.lanecoffee.com. Well, it's been a while, everybody, since we've done a Prime Cuts. In fact, I, I didn't do a Prime Cuts at all in April. I did run the Rumor Free Teaser Free Show, but it's Will Cooper here. I'm in the Serino Cigar Company studio. And on Prime Cuts, you know, this is a, a, a kind of an agile show. When there are newsworthy things, it gives me an opportunity to, do, to deliver a lightweight podcast. At the same time, do some experimental stuff. And there's two of these. There's actually the Rumor Free Teaser Free one, which is non-cigar related. And Prime Cuts, which is cigar-related. And tonight we're going to talk about the 2018 TAA releases. Um, you know, I've been very vocal. If you watch the very first episode of the Primetime Show, I've been critical of the TAA in particular. Um, it's the most difficult series of cigars to cover. I'm going to be completely honest with you. It is a very difficult thing to cover, and I'll get into some of the details. I've been extremely frustrated with covering it um, because it is it is hard to cover it. Um, nonetheless, it's an important year for the Tobacconist Association of America in that they're celebrating their 50th anniversary, and that, that's a great achievement no matter how you look at it. And the, the TAA, a lot of folks, they're not a policy organization. I would say they are a networking organization of leading retailers. Um, it's an invitation-only club. Um, and really what they do is they gather once a year to do some massive volume buying. And, you know, the big question I ask is, am I going to TAA? And the answer is probably never um, because I don't think they want uh, online media anywhere near um, the convention because there's some sensitive things around pricing. And, and I can understand that part. It's not a criticism of them. I, I, I think that, you know, they're not a policymaking organization organizations so I, I kind of get it I'm not sure if there is a place for online media there um, that being said um, as far as one part that we do like to cover is the uh, series of exclusive cigars that go to uh, the member retailers that they can carry exclusively in their stores now I mentioned it's a it's a tough thing to get hold of these uh, to get this information and I think a lot of the problem is on my end. I'll be completely honest. Rather than bash the TAA, I'll fall on my sword a bit. And I think it's the way we want to cover the TAA, which the more I think about it, I think it's the way I've done it on Cigar Coop is the way it sh I think it should be done. However, I don't know if it's a practical way to do it. And let me explain why. Um, our goal is to cover the entire series that's released for the year. So we want to cover every single cigar that's out there and review every single cigar in a collective fashion. I think it's kind of a fun thing to do. For the past four years, Cigar Coop's been the only media site to do that, as far as I know. And uh, it's a, it, But at the same time, we have to learn about the cigar. And the way we learn about the cigars is through news releases and press releases. Um, when it's come to the TAA cigars, it's been very hard to get this information, probably harder than anything else. And I think what's happened is the manufacturers don't want to invest marketing time on these TAA releases. Some of them do. Some of them have done it, Hoya de Nicaragua, Crowned Heads, but others don't want to really do that, and they want to rely on the TAA to do that. And not to pick on the TAA, I don't think they're equipped to be in the press business. So as a result, basically this stuff doesn't come out. It trickles out. It's a big chase to do it. And to chase this information down from a small media brand like myself, quite difficult. So it's kind of had me as frustrated as I am about this, I think it's part of the system, and I'm not sure if there's a way to fix it. Now, the other thing that's happened is the TAA uh, cigars have grown enormously in terms of the amount of cigars that are released. I mean, it used to be one cigar. Like, someone would, would get the honor of doing that cigar, and then it, it's grown. And today, I believe we're going to see 
this year's series has 23 releases, including um, 14 new ones. So um, that's quite a lot, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Um, so, you know, that's quite a lot to have um, new releases out there. So uh, I count, yeah, I counted 23 and four and 14 um, new releases there. So it's not something easily that I, I can get that information. So it's leading me to basically wonder if it's worth continuing the, to review the TAA cigars as a collection. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm trying to see if I can make some communication on this. And this year was frustrating. Um, the, the list has grown with the amount of cigars. And I mentioned 14 new releases, 23 releases overall. And the reason is because it's the TAA's 50th anniversary. And um, they made a decision to create all these cigars. And it, it's been very, very difficult chasing this information down. So, but um, the, there was, you know, and, and all I wanted was get like a one sheet, a one sheeter with this stuff. A nice cheat sheet. I can talk about it. Um, I didn't get one, right? But but Pope Marvin and the co Pope Marvin and the College of Cardinals at Cigar Aficionado did, which was great news. So at least Pope Marvin and, and, and the Cardinals got it over at Cigar Aficionado. Um, at least someone got it, okay? So what I'm going to kind of disclaim is ain't most of the stuff I'm going to talk about on this list tonight that I know about and I've been able to do some research today on have come through uh, Cigar Aficionado. And, and like I said, it, while it would have been great if all the media got it, um, especially with the amount of releases right now, and there's, there's way too many TAA releases. I, I don't think this was the best move for the 50th anniversary. Um I, I hear retailers say already there's too many TA releases. From a cigar enthusiast's uh, perspective, it's great news, though, because there's a lot of stuff that you could certainly choose from. So, you know, you know, from, from the cigar end, it's great. Retailers may be scratching their head there's too many. Media is just pulling their hair out trying to cover these releases. Um, you know, so it's kind of a difficult thing to do. But let's get right. I mean, we want to talk about the cigars tonight. Um, so let's kind of get into it. But before, what am I smoking tonight? Um, I'm not smoking a TAA cigar tonight because I smoked all my TAA cigars for the review. I'm smoking the new Camacho Coyola, uh in the Rothschild size. Now, the Coyola is a line that was brought back by Camacho this year. Um, and it was a line created when the Aroas had it. And I'm smoking the Rothschild size. I've gotten to know Julio Aroa um, over the past year, who's the patriarch of the Aroa family. He loves the Rothschild size. Um, so I'm, I could I would bet money this was created for him, and I'm glad to see Camacho brought back the Rothschild size. I love a Rothschild. I think it's the most underrated Vitola out there. That that you know that that smaller robusto. It, it's just I find it very satisfying. So um, burns a little wonky, but I will disclaim that this is a this was a pre-release sample that I had traveling with me. So a potent cigar is what I'll just tell you. This is Camacho balls to the wall, but I digress. Let's get into the um, the cigars. Um, so let's start it off with um, my father's cigars. Uh, is is going to be a part of the 2018 TAA exclusive series, and for this year's uh, TAA exclusive, they are actually bringing back a limited edition. Um, size of the Floridios Antias that was once released, and it is a seven and a half by thirty-eight Floridios Antias Lancero, um, and that was originally released from what I, I from what I know of, the, of that size because that Lancero size has been out before, but it was a single shop exclusive I think that originally went to Up and Smoke in Dallas, Texas, so not a new release but something that. You know, again, with FDA, my father can uh, yeah, easily can go in. They have a large number of shop exclusives on the market, um, and they can certainly go in to and tap into that. And they tap into a 7.5 by 38 ring gauge uh, for the, um, for the uh, excuse me, for the TAA this year. Um, so that's a good job. And it's the second year in a row that they've actually brought back a um, an older, I'd say an older release of the um, – of a release last year, they brought back an old TAA release, which was the Jaime Garcia 2011 release. So, uh, from that perspective, that was a good job. By uh, that was one of the more popular ones that were out there. But um, my father's cigars has been now five years in a row. They've been part of the TAA series. 
Um, in 2014, they had uh, they had a My Father TAA cigar. In 2015, they had a La Antigüedad with a different wrapper. In 2016, they went to the El Centurion H2KCT, and they brought in a box press torpedo, which was an exclusive size. And then last year, they brought back the 2011 one, uh, which was the Jaime Garcia Reserva Especial box press torpedo. So uh, in 2012 and 13, they didn't have a TA release. Now, the one thing I'll just say about this cigar, and I have smoked it. It's actually a really good cigar. I'm, I'm thinking the TAA retailers um, have got to be just doing handstands that they're going to be having to carry a Lancero cigar. Um, I think from a cigar connoisseur's standpoint, which sometimes I think the TAA doesn't reach well enough that those cigar – I don't want to use the G word, but I, I don't want to use the N word. But I'll say those cigar connoisseurs, the hardcore – uh, boutique smoker, you know, who loves the Lancero. I think sometimes they get ignored by the TA. So as much as the retailers may not uh, like that, it is a good, um, it's a nice job, you know, by I think the TA to show a little bit of let's go out of the box a bit. And I, like I said, I don't think the retailers are thrilled, but I think this is a good move. Uh, it's good to see that this is, like I said, this is a pretty good cigar. Um, and certainly I think uh, it will do very well for my father's cigars and the Tobacconist Association of America. So that's number one. Number two uh, is the CLE Aroa First 20 Years Diadema. Um, this is a Diadema. It's a massive 8-inch eight, uh, eight cigar where at its fattest point it is a 68 ring gauge. Uh, and from what Cr Christian Aroa talked about it on Primetime Special Edition number 29, it's a Honduran Puro. From what I understand, they're using a Mexican seed wrapper in that. And I think that was a nice, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's something that's new as far as what CLE is doing. Um, CLE tends to do things a little differently uh, with their TA releases. They've been now part of the TAA, I want to say, for the past. Um, they've been a part of the TAA series also for the past Four, this is the fourth year in a row they've been a part of the TAA. So if you look at what they've done, um, they kind of alternate between uh, Asylum and CL, the, the non-Asylum brands. So in 2006, uh, in 2000, excuse me, 2015, they released the Asylum Nyctophilia Maduro. In 2016, they released the CLE Azabaki. Azabachi, um, I know I'm butchering that name. Sorry, Christian. Christian knows I butcher the names. And in 2017, they released a box press 7x70 version of the Asylum 13. And now this year, they go to an Aroa uh, Diadema, a first year, 20 year Diadema. So it's been Asylum, CLE, Asylum, S Aroa. So they've kind of alternated. The different with what the approach that they've taken uh, with, with CLE is they introduced it for the TLA and, and the, the, T the TAA. And from what both Christian and Tom Wazuka told me is they give the they give the TA the option if they want to keep it or have something different. And every year they've opted to have something different. Um, what CLE then does is they take that line and they incorporate it into their regular production offering. So essentially what they do is they, they give it to the TAA for at least a year, and then at that point they can move on and get something different. Uh, so it's an interesting strategy by um, – by Christian Aroa, uh, I said, who is now becoming a mainstay of the um, the TA series. So this is one I, you know, the Aroa first twenty years is 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 a is a very premium line, and I think that's an excellent offering. Uh, nice to see a diadema in the series again. If you're trying to reach a connoisseur type of thing, that's a good job by CLE there. All right, we go next to um, the next one is, and I don't think this. This brand has had a, a TAA release before. It's the CAO, uh, CAO Cigars, uh, brand under General Cigars, one of their better doing brands. And they have the CAO Esteli, which is a, um, a, from what I understand, it's a blend that has a Nicaraguan wrapper, Honduran binder, and a mix of Honduran and Dominican uh, fillers uh, in there. Um, there was a, this information wasn't as good as I would have liked. I believe it's in one size, a six by fifty four Toro, um, and it's uh, you can see it had some of the pictures I've seen. This has been floating around. Some people got a press release on this. Some people didn't. I don't quite understand. This is one of the cigars 
that actually they did press release early on, but I, I don't understand why certain people got the press release and certain people didn't. Welcome to the cigar world. Uh, welcome to my world on that. Um, but it's pulling a limit of 1,500 boxes that are going to go to the uh, TA, 10 count boxes there. Um, I don't have, do, do I have pricing on that one? I don't think I got pricing on that one. I'm just going to double check my notes here. Um, and Oh, yes, they have 899 MSRP is going to be, uh, is, is kind of what I was told uh, from talking there. Um, here's the one thing I'm going to say about this one. I don't quite understand. Maybe the TAA tried, but, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of Macanudo this year with General. So why wouldn't you? I, I don't know. To me, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about another cigar that, that is incorporating their 50th anniversary as a part of the TAA series. To me, it would have made sense. They could have found a Mac. I think they could find a Macanudo that could have went to the TAA. What, maybe you bring back one of those Jamaican blends or something, but, uh, you know, some of the coffin releases. I, I, I'm nothing against the CAO Esteli. I think it's, that's a nice, uh, nice job. It's great to see CAO as a part of the TAA series. I don't understand why, why a Macanudo being the 50th anniversary, marketing-wise, uh, I and maybe maybe the TAA tried on that. So maybe maybe there was discussion and it didn't work out. I would have found a way to make that work out, to be honest with you. Um, so that's the that's uh, the fourth one, the CAO Esteli. Now the next one on my list, and this is the one that everyone, if there's a you know if there's a TAA cigar that everyone's talking about it's the it's the padron um now i started seeing i saw a couple of reports on this yesterday that there was going to be a cigar called the padron black being released um not much information other than it was, other than it was a 6x46 corona gorda um did not but there was not much information known i did do some digging on this cigar I did look at the Cigar Aficionado reports. I did look at some digging from people I do know in the t uh, who are down at TAA. And I, I tried to cobble some stuff a bit. So this Padron is actually the Padron Black. It is the Padron Black number 89. It is a 6x46 Corona Gorda available in Natural or Maduro. So, and it retails for $16.50 and it comes in box of 10. From looking at the information about this cigar versus... Um, what I what I've been able to know, this I believe is a re-release of the the Padron number eighty nine, which was released in late two thousand, actually early two thousand sixteen, for Jose Orlando Padron's birthday, and they they called it the number eighty nine because his birthday was actually in June, and they had a party for him earlier in the year, and the party was at Smoke Inn, and these boxes of 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 the Padron number eighty nine were made available to smoke in um and it was sold in one night these things went fast um and it and it, what but it wasn't called the padron black this is unconfirmed information but i but from what i've been able to put together based on the pricing based on the size and based on the fact it's an 89 and based on the fact that both of these cigars have a black label i've concluded that i believe that this that this is a re-release of the smoke in cigar so, you know, we're going to we're going to try to validate that. But I think if you want to and, and I'm certainly I would think it's close now, the banding on this thing. And, and, and as a, if you go to Cigar Coop, and I'll try to put a link into this as well. Um, it looks like the Padron Thousand Series band with a um, but black in color as opposed to brown. And then under it, it's one of those serial number bands, you know, the one the, those under bands that, that, that are on the 64 and 26 um, that have a serial number on it. So. That's what the, that's what the smoke in cigars look like. I haven't been able to confirm again if the Padron cigars are the same cigar or not. My get, I'm 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 kind of like I said, I'm gonna say it's unconfirmed information, but I believe from what everything I've been able to put together right now, and and, and again, I I think this is a little beyond the rumor size. We know that there's a number 89 being released. We know it's uh the same size. We know the pricing is exactly the same. Um, we we do know it's a natural Maduro. From talking, it sounds like from people on the ground, they believe it's the same cigar. Um, we may, you know, but we don't know right now. But so we'll just kind of say, so that's what I, if you need to know about the Padron Black, um, you heard it here first. So if you see other shows kind of start to talk about this, um, I believe I'm the first, you know, I believe you heard it here first. Just remember that. Um, 
So, you know, but that so that that is, I think, the cigar that everyone's going to be talking about. Now, if it's the same cigar, assuming it is, that cigar is a home run, especially in the Maduro. Uh, this is going to be this could be one of those TAA cigars that is talked about for a long time, uh, especially that Maduro. And I, and I think this is something that the TAA desperately needed. Um, they desperately needed another brand. I mean, for the past few years, it's really been Tatawai, LaFleur, and Crown Heads who have been the, the, the standout brands of consistency. But I think this Padron is at a, especially that, I'll say at the Maduro is at another level right now. It is a home run uh, by Padron, and I think it's going to be talked about. I think people, that cigar is going to sell it very, very fast. I think Padron fans will be extremely pleased with it. And I know the ones, again, if it's the smoke-in one, people love that cigar in both the Natural and the Maduro. So that is the Padron Black number 89. Um, the next up is, I mentioned them, uh, and it's, like I said, there's two Padron Natural Maduro. Um, I mentioned them just a couple minutes ago, but La Florida Minicana, they've been an absolute staple uh, in the um, – They've been an, I'd say they've been one of the staples in in this in the TA series for the past few years. I think they've done a really really good job uh, as far as um, what we've seen out of them. You know, I think it's a I think what we've seen out of LaFleur, they they've done the quality consistently there. You know, that's one thing I really I, I really like about that is you know you do see the quality out there with the LaFleur releases year after year after year. And they've had a couple of really good ones in the last couple of years. And now, certainly, they come back with a, um, a, a cigar for the 50th anniversary of the TAA. And that cigar is called the uh, La Flor Dominicana Golden Ana Oro Anniversary. So, obviously, golden, you know, th th they're tying it in with the, uh, with the 50 year theme which I think is really cool that they're going to tie it in, you know. And what they're doing is if you know the LaFleur Oro series, um, then you know that the uh, the Oro series uh, is – it has those LaFleur Dominicana gold bands. The one thing is I don't think that this is the same blend as that Oro series. Um, what we do know about this cigar – and I have to talk to John Carney on this in fairness. I think they were kind of waiting to unveil this cigar – at the TAA, and it's a good job by them. Uh, it's a six and a half by 54 box press torpedo. And Cigar Fish and I was saying it's using Criollo 99 filler grown at uh, La Florida Minicana's La Canela Farm, and it's the first time for the company. So, you know, I always like what La Florida does because they bring something they, they bring something to the table every year with their TAA releases, I think, for the most part. Um, they've been a staple of the TAA. Um, they've been an absolute staple of the TAA for the past, I want to say, seven years. You know, so, you know, if you go back to 2012, Airbender Maduro Toro. 2013, the Double Press Maduro. That was a great cigar. 2014, the uh, 707, which was the 70 by, uh, the 70 by, se the 7 by 70. Um, 2015 was the TA 47. And then 2016 was the TA 48 uh, with the event TA 48 Celebration Limited Edition. And that TA48 Celebration Limited Edition became the LaFleur Dominicana TA49. And like I said, the last three years, LaFleur Dominicana has really been firing on all cylinders. Um, so I think this, you know, obviously this LaFleur Dominicana is one that is going to be, people are going to be looking forward to. And, uh, you know, like I said, they're, 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 like I said, they're a staple. They're definitely a staple when it comes to this, um, when it comes to the TAA. You know, there's certainly, um, there's certainly, a part of it, they they've been a big part of it, and they, they deliver really good releases there. Um, so the Florida Man kind of another staple line, uh, the line that obviously I think for the past seven years, if you want to say has been that dominant line, it's the Tatawahe TAA line. Um, and there's for the eighth year in a row, there's a Tatawahe TAA cigar. It's called the Tatawahe uh, TAA exclusive, uh, the TAA fiftieth. This year's edition is a five by fifty two. Uh, box press Robusto, uh, and it features a Connecticut Broadleaf, Rosado, a squirrel wrapper over Nicaraguan binder and filler. Um, I don't know. I don't know much more about if this is a 
a different the one thing I, I did not know on this is if the blend is different than the like they've used broadleaf tattoo has used broadleaf on these cigars every year since it started with the exception of 2013 um so yeah, it's using broadleaf ris risotto oscuro, but I, I can't tell you much more than that. But it, but since it's in new size, the blend's obviously tweaked to that size. So in the end, I think it kind of negates it, um, you know, because you're getting a, a different experience. The first time a 5x52 box press with Busto has been put into a TAA cigar by Tatuaje. Interesting thing about Tatuaje is, you know, they the first uh, two in, in 2011, they came out with that 5x58x54 for the 2011, and that was a Broadleaf. In 2012, it was a six and a half by 50. Um, and then in 2013, they, they went to the brown label blend and released the Grand Chasseur to uh, coincide with Tatawai's 10th anniversary, which was a six and three ace by 54. Um, beautiful cigar, um, beautiful cigar. That's that, that, that Grand Toro that they released that year. And then in the TA 2014 was a six by 52 Toro. And then the last three years have been a repeat of the first three Broadleaf releases. So the TA 2015 was, again, that 5 and a eight by 54 size used on the 2011. The 2016 was, again, the 6 and a quarter by 50 size used on the 2012. And last year it was the 6 by 52 for the 2017, same size used on the 2014. If you could memorize all that, good job. But, uh, you know, so obviously Tatawahe, uh, they got something special. Pete Johnson, uh, a lot of people will tell you maybe the that Pete Johnson really put the TAA series on the map with that 2011 release. I, I've, you know, I always say the 2015, I think, was his best work, which was a redo, which was a reversion, a, 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 re, a redo, I hate that word, redo of the 2011. Um, but good job by Pete Johnson. He is, you know. Again, we talk about the three brands that have dominated the TAA in the last eight years. You got to put Tatawahe, La Florida Minicana, and Crown Heads certainly in it. And all three of those are in that story as far as which ones are the ones that really talk about. But I think that Padron, I think that Padron Black Maduro is going to be one people are talking about if it's the same cigar. Um, Altidus, from what this has been a little bit. Uh, I believe I've been able to confirm this, but Altinus is going to have a TA cigar for the first time in a few years. They haven't had one in a while, to be honest with you. I think it's been three or four years since they've had one. Um, they are coming in this year with the Monte Cristo Artisan, um, and it's a re-release of the Monte Cr of the first batch, batch one of the of the Monte Cristo Artisan uh, series. So this is a a very premium. Um, I'll say this is a more premium offering under the Monte Cristo line. Um, it was released in 2016, um, and they're in these, like, 15-count boxes where you kind of – the sides open up. Uh, they're really, really – actually, it's actually we reviewed this cigar in Cigar Coop. Um, so this is – like I said, it's a re-release of this particular cigar. Uh, the blend was an Ecuadorian Habano blend over Dominican binder and Dominican and Honduran filler made at the Tabacalera de Garcia um, factory. And um, it was a it was one of those cigars that was done by the Grupo de Maestros, which is Altidus most experienced cigar makers. They had uh, what was interesting. They had um, various uh, members of the team participated. And if you look at the box, it talks about who rolled the cigars and who blended the cigars. Kind of a team effort there. I haven't, uh, but from all, there's been three releases of the Artisan series. They've done a 2017 uh, batch two, and they did a 2000, uh, they, uh, they, they did a 2015, yeah, let me, let's start that again. They did, okay, let's go back. The first Artisan series came out in 2016, um, and then there was two more that followed that. So, if that makes any sense, they've come out with, uh, did, actually, I'm sorry, there's one more to follow that. There was a batch two that came out to 2017, I think, is the order, which was a different blend. So there wasn't three. My, my mistake, two of them in there. Um, I heard this is going to have a premium price point. Uh, the Monte Cristo Artisan series, the other thing, just kind of what you need to know about that cigar is it's coming in one size. It's a 6x54 Toro, which was the only size the Artisan was released in. So uh, Altidus returns to the party. They bring back an old favorite. Uh, for the line. Moving forward, um, 
E.P. Carrillo joins the party this year. Um, Jose Blanco spilled the beans on, on social media, which good job by Jose Blanco. Someone needs to spill the beans and actually tell the, tell what these cigars are once in a while. And I'm glad to see Jose actually didn't just put a picture up, but he told what the cigar was. So we were able to get some good information. Uh, 6x52 Toro. Uh, Blanco saying the blend is Connecticut Habano. Uh, wrapper over uh, an old Nicaraguan blend. And if you, it's, uh, the Connecticut Habano has been something that uh, Ernesto worked with with crowned heads for their Four Kicks Maduro. And Ernesto's been going to more Nicaraguan tobaccos in his blends in recent years. No surprise there. 6x52 Toro. First time E.P. Carrillo, um is um, going to be at the party, <laughs> so so to speak. But, uh, again, a good job. Um, good to see Ernesto in as part of the series this year. I think it's long overdue for Ernesto Perez Carrillo Jr. with E.P. Carrillo to have his own uh, TAA cigar. So I'm sure we'll see Jose Blanco smoking plenty of those. So good job. Again, good job by Jose kind of getting the information out there. Um, next up, um, Hoya de Nicaragua returns for the first time in, I want to say, five years. As they've had a, um, Yeah, five years was the last time Hoya de Nicaragua had a, um, a TAA release. Um, so if you remember back in 2013, uh, again, Jose Blanco's uh, Cuenca y Blanco, a.k.a. the CYB blend, uh, came out with a Lancero for the TAA that year. Um, again, one of the few Lanceros that's gone to the TAA. So it's been five years, but this year, it's Hoya de Nicaragua's 50th anniversary. Made a lot of sense for them to have a, a cigar as part of the 50th anniversary. And what they have opted to do is uh, they're releasing a line extension of their... Uh, Grand Nicaragua, uh, Hoya de Nicaragua Grand Reserva, uh, line. It is called the, um, it, the Presidente size. It is a six and a half by 50 Toro. So the, the Hoya de Nicaragua Antonio Grand Reserva is actually an older version of the Antonio that was released some time ago that was re-released last year. And really what they use is they use, it's, it's the Antonio blend, that all Nicaraguan blend, which is the Antonio, actually it's the Antonio 1970 blend. And that Antonio 1970 is a powerful blend. It's, it's kind of like my Coyolar, which I'm milking here because it's strong. But, um, but I'm talking too. So that ends up, what they did is by aging the tobacco, kind of tame the blend a bit, give it a little bit of a different profile. They, they knocked it out of the park with that. So they add, you know, again, 50th anniversary of Hoya de Nicaragua. 50th anniversary of uh, the TAA, it's Marriage Made in Heaven. Uh, Antonio is certainly such an important part of the Hoya history, uh, and I think putting that Grand Reserva size is a kind of a bridge to the past and moving ahead to the future. Good job by Hoya to Nicaragua and the TAA. I think this is going to be an under-the-radar release. I'm, like I said, this line is a very good line here. Uh, good job by Dr. Cuenca and his son Juan Ignacio Martinez there. So look forward to that one as well. So that's a line extension. Um, the next cigar is uh, La Polina. Bill Paley returns to the table for the first time, uh, actually for the third year in a row, with a TAA release. Um, and the interesting thing is La Polina has taken a little bit of a similar tactic that um, that Christian Aroa has. So in 2016, they had their first TA release with Bill's Blend, uh, which actually was a Toro size of the La Polina Illumination. So Bill's Blend and the La Polina Illumination Toro were the same thing. Uh, after that year was up, that uh, Bill's Blend was incorporated into the Illumination line as a Toro size. Uh, last year, they opted to go with the La Polina Bronze Label, which is a cigar that um, made at the Placencia factory in Honduras. Um, they gave a Toro size to the TA, and just early this year they announced they're introducing bronze label as a regular line with eight, uh, with three sizes. Um, this year they're doing another color, the La Polina uh, Blue Label. We don't know much about this cigar other than it's a six and a half by fifty two Toro made with Honduran and Nicaraguan tobaccos and retails for nine ninety nine. That's per cigar aficionado. Now here's the catch: Blue Label's out there, guys. It's not a new cigar. 
Blue Label was a, was was stealth release to uh, retailers. If you want to find La Polina Blue Label, I, I, I'm probably going to get in trouble saying, call my buddy at Havana Phil's in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and he's got La Polina Blue Labels because that was one that was stealth released for the FDA. Um, and Havana Phil uh, has got them. So I, I think I can't comment on the sizes. I believe he has Toros. Um, but the lot, you know, and I can't comment if they've tweaked the blend since then. I can't tell you that other than the brand was out there before. And, and I know it's still out there. So, uh, you know, like I said, La Polina did release this cigar before. Bronze Label was in a similar boat. I know my friend uh, Reagan at R&R had the Bronze Labels when they were announced to the TA. So, but that's some of the necessity of introducing product to market in this FDA world. This isn't to, to pick on anyone. But, but there are a lot, if you don't want to wait for La Polina Blue Label, you can call Havana Phil um, and do that. Uh, we move forward. Uh, I got to say, you know, Crown Heads, good job by Crown Heads. And I mentioned they're one of those brands that are become the staple of the TAA. Uh, they got us a press release. Um, real, it's a really good job. But they got a press release. And this year they uh, they go and they release the, uh, the fifth, their fifth version of the Angel's Anvil. So it's a fifth year in a row they produce that TAA cigar. Um, as With all the other installments, they work with Ernesto Perez Carrillo Jr., to blend that cigar, it's an Ecuadorian Sumatra wrapper over Nicaraguan binder and filler. So again, Ernesto likes that um, that Nicaraguan binder and filler. He's gone to that more lately, and it's offered in one size, a five and a half by fifty-two Genios, aka Robusto size on that one. Um, it's also the first time they've used Ecuadorian Sumatra on the the Angel's Anvil. And if you look at the the acronym for Angel's Anvil, T A A, the Angel's Anvil. How about that? Uh, but it's the first time the Sumatra is being used on it. And you think about Sumatra, it's an Ernesto Perez Creo Jr. staple wrapper. It is a very, very, uh, it's, a, it's a wrapper that always is um, one that's, that's a part of the, uh, of the series. And, um, you know, that's good that they've gotten that on. So Ernesto has two cigars, actually, this year out there that he's producing for the TAA. So busy year for Ernesto. No wonder Jose Blanco's been on the road a lot. You know, obviously Ernesto... Definitely in the factory, obviously making sure the production of these things go really smoothly as well. So I think a a very very good job by uh, by uh, t uh, Crown Heads there. They've had Crown Heads. I wasn't a fan of the 2014 TA, but they've knocked it out of the park the last three years with the TA releases, and they have really become one of the more staple. They've become one of more those staple lines in in the TA series. Um, not to be outdone. Um. Gurker Cigars is coming to the party this year for the TA with their first cigar. And, and, and you know, the press release seem, is a little different than what I'm seeing reported by Aficionado and some of the people down in, in the DR uh, who are at the convention. But it's supposedly an extension to the Gurkha Heritage line consisting of an Ecuadorian Habano wrapper, a uh, Ecuadorian binder, and Peruvian and Nic Nicaraguan fillers, and a 6x52 Toro. Uh, it's called the, the Gurkha... Heritage Rosado Toro TA exclusive. It's supposed to ship th this month. So it's going to be one of the. Uh, they're saying it's going to ship either this month. Oh, here's it. The press release said it was going to ship later this year by the summer. And, the pr and from what I'm getting down there, it's supposed to ship earlier there right now. So I don't know. I don't know quite. But Gurker's got a TA cigar. Um, I think it's a good job. I think Gurker, you know, there's some, there's some good. The Gurker Heritage line is a great line, actually, by them. If you haven't given the Gurker Heritage line a chance, give that line a chance. It, it, it's it's a, it's a, they've done a nice job with that's one of the better lines they've come out with so they're part of the party as well um moving just so those are the 14 blends um now there are what those are what were released this year there are some ongoing releases by the TAA which um are released year after year for some time and uh, there are um let me see I have a list of eight more of those. Uh, actually, nine more of those. Sorry about that, because Padron has two. So there's nine more of those. So let's kind of go through these. Uh, the Alec Mar uh, Bradley Black Market Illicit, which we reviewed on Cigar Coop. Uh, the Ashton VSG Robusto Especial. That's been one that's been offered for a long time. Drew State Acid Big Bang. Acid fans like that cigar. That's been around for a long time, too. Drew State Herrera Esteli Maduro, released a couple years ago. One uh, Became a regular offering at of the TA. That's a really good cigar, by the way. Uh, Christoph's TAA 49 Salomon. Um, if you haven't smoked that cigar, 
Uh, that was the best TA cigar to came out in 2017. Glenn Case and his team knocked that thing out of the park. Um, that is a that is a cigar worthy of having the TA name on it. It's a beautiful Solomon. It's one of the best cigars Glenn's released. I'm very high on that cigar. Um, if he released it to everybody, I could probably make it eligible on my top 25, but TA cigars are too limited to be eligible. Uh, Nat Chairman Pan Americano released a few years ago. Um, that's, a, that's an ongoing. There's seven sides as a part of that. Of course, the Padron 1964 Anniversary Toro uh, in a natural and Maduro, so there's two of those. That's been around forever. And finally, the Rocky Patel Martinique, which we did review on Cigar Coop. Here's a challenge. If anyone can find me a store that has a Rocky Patel Martinique, let me know. Because that is the least talked about TAA cigar I've ever heard of. Uh, I found it at Neptune Cigar uh, last year in, in Florida. But uh, I, don't, I don't get it right now. So you have a total of 23. Again, we have 14 new releases. And we have nine of these ongoing releases. Did I, did I do my math right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's way too many, guys. I mean, if you're a TA retailer, come on. That's, that is, that is, I, that's a lot to ask. Um, and, and, you know, there's some point where I don't think you needed to have 23. I think you could have done maybe – I would have loved to see some of the old favorites come back in this series over the years. You know, maybe bring out, like, some really good ones. Put You know, I don't know. I just, I just think there's way too many of these cigars. If someone from the TA can explain business-wise why this is good, um, let me know. Um, w because, again, I just think if you're not – these cigars need to be marketed. Um, there's a lot that you're asking your retailers to bring in right now. And I don't know if they bring in all these cigars, but it's a lot to tax. I mean, if you're going to bring in uh, some number of these, it's a lot to do. So that's just my two cents. But if you're a cigar fan – uh, you are going to have a lot to look forward to. Uh, I know that, and, and we'll be tr we're going to try to review this whole series this year. Oh, no, there's one more. There is one more, uh, and I left one out. So it's actually 24. My apologies. Fuente, but, and the reason is because we we know nothing about this release, but uh, there's going to be a Fuente Fuente Opus X box set, six different sizes in a box. Details still to be determined. So it's actually 24 guys. How can I forget the Fuente Fuente Opus X? And I'm hearing that this is going to be like really limited for retailers. Um, so 24. How can I did leave out the Fuente Fuente Opus X? So quite a bit out there. How about that? That's when you these. It's so confusing. Uh, but you know the we. I, I have a little bit of. A, I mean the Fuente Fuente. I think it's great that Fuente is part of the TA series. I just think you know I don't s doing an Uber release for the t an, an Uber release for the TA. I don't know how that's the answer, but and I love Opus X and I love Arturo Fuente. It's just way too. But I'm hearing maybe only, there's gonna be six sizes in a box, and I'm hearing only four boxes per retailer, and they're not gonna break the boxes up. Guess what? You're not gonna guess what? There's gonna be very few people who get that cigar, which is why we probably won't be able to review the whole series this year, um, unfortunately. But we'll tr you know because because it's gonna be the retailers are not gonna break up those those. Those six sizes in the box, um, and I think it's I think there's multiple. I think there may be twelve in a box. I don't. So th these boxes aren't going to get broken up. So recapping, we'll recap what the new releases are: the Florio Santiago Lancero, the C L E Diadema, the C A O Esteli, the Padrone Black Nine Number Eighty Nine Maduro Natural, the La Florida Minicana Golden Oro Anniversary, the Tatawahe T A A Fiftieth, the Monte Cristo Artisan Series Toro. The E.P. Carrillo TA Exclusive, the Hoya de Nicaragua Antonio Gran Reserva Presidente, the La Polina Blue Label Toro, the Angels Anvil 2018, the Gurkha Heritage TA Exclusive, and the Fuente Fuente Opus X with the six special sizes. Will Cooper here in the Sereno Cigar Company Studios in North Carolina. We just went through uh, and reviewed the TAA cigars for this uh for this year and finally like i said they good good job that they got it to uh to get got it to pope marvin and the college of cardinals over at uh cigar aficionado so i want to again good job by cigar aficionado because you know, that stuff really did need to be printed uh and if, and if you know if it has to go to someone so i'm glad it did go to someone I, um on that 
that we were, that media was able to get some sort of access to that because it was it was very hard to get that information. Anyway, let's talk about uh, IPCVR had some big news. In, uh, here is the thing: IPCVR is going into the trade show for 2018, and I think they're going in uh, on a higher level than they've ever had a, in, in the last couple of years. It's the last three trade shows for the IPCVR have been have been brutal. Okay, and I, and I always say. IPCBR takes it on the chin a lot for the cigar industry. They get they'll get blamed if if if, it, if the weather if the weather was supposed to be sunny and it rains, they'll blame the IPCBR. For some reason, people just get wound up about IPCBR and the trade show. I don't understand it. I, I just don't. I think people just I don't get what is not. I mean, is it interesting? Yeah, but I don't get this. When, I mean, people just I see the calmest people in the world. They get wound up and they're like, ah, IPCBR, IPCBR. I'm like, I can't do that. You know, I can't deal with it. Uh, you know, they get they, they get frustrated. They get flustered. I see people get flustered. I'm like, and I don't see why it has to be like that. Um, they do a good job in a lot of cases. I mean, and, and, and are they perfect? No. Um, you can say what you want. Do they have a specific agenda? Yeah. Um, do they need to let media people get samples on the trade show floor? Yes, media people need to be allowed to ask for samples. Sorry, guys, that's a reality. Um, do, should, do media people need to have their access early uh, and not have to buy a pack ticket? Yes. All right, those are my two little beefs. But in general, they do a really good job. And there's, anytime I've needed help at the IPCBR, um, at the trade show, I've gotten responsiveness, and they're very busy do, uh, doing stuff. So I think there's some positive things. And, we, you know, I, well, I had my little jabs I just took in, and they're minor in, in, in the grand scheme of things. I think there are certainly things that could be resolved. Um, Although those two I've not gotten any traction on, but anyway, um, but so they, you know, but the last three trade shows have been very difficult. Um, you know, if you go back to 2015, they they moved the trade show to New Orleans, right? And what happens? Uh, there's this there's this comprehensive smoking ban, and now IPCB has got to deal with putting on a trade show in a city with a very restrictive smoking ban. Tough job, tough job, okay. Um, I think they did the best. I think they really tried. I think they tried to make everyone accommodate. Was it perfect? No. Maybe the trade show should have never went to New Orleans to begin with, but uh, in 2015. But I, I think they tried on that one. And I think they did, uh, considering, I think they did a good job. But it wasn't perfect. 2016, the whole FDA black cloud, the deeming reorganizations come out about two months before the trade show. They got to go and put a trade show on with this whole feeling of the unknown because the deeming regulations were going in only a few weeks afterwards. Um, somber mood at the trade show. I don't think people really um, were able to, you know, I think, again, tough circumstances to put a trade show on under those conditions. And then just when, you know, I, maybe some of the malaise from 2016 was wearing off, we find out at the end of 2016 that the trade show can no longer be held at the Sands Convention Center. For whatever reason, um, uh, there, there's a lot of misinformation that's been reported on that. I don't think anyone knows what the real story was. Someone's, uh, but but we had to move it to the Las Vegas Convention Center. Um, give the IPCB our credit; they were able. You know, it wasn't perfect. I'm sure people didn't get their booze, but they were able to put on a trade show. That was combined with the new uh, California tax laws that went into effect that kept people away from the trade show. They had a they had a brutal trade show in 2017. I think that was one that, you know, they would like, if they had to erase it from the books, um, I think IPCB would, would, you know, every trade show can't be great and spectacular. Uh, we had a great opening gala on that, but then after that, it was a very, I think it was a rough show for a lot of people. Um, the, the location for the, um, the location for the trade show at the Las Vegas Convention, people didn't like it because it was off the strip uh, and the Westgate Hotel really wasn't, um, people didn't like it. So I think that hurt a bit. Um, now we move forward to 2018. The trade show is going back there in two months, uh, and we got to deal with that. But the good news is there was questions after 2018: where would the trade show be? Right, that was the big question: where would it be? Well, IPCBR addressed that um, this week. I was, you know, and, and they announced that we are going back to Las Vegas for two years, 2019 and 2020. So, uh, as well as be there for 2018. And while we'll be at the Las Vegas Convention Center in 2018, in 2019, we are going back to the Sands. And I think it's a welcome thing. I think it's important not bec because of it, people going to – yes, I think it's important that people like that location better. But I think that question's off the table right now. 
Like people aren't going to be worried where that trade show is next year. It's it's signed, sealed, and hopefully delivers. Um, signed and sealed. We hope it delivers. But but yeah, that's good news by the by for folks right now. So I think that they won't have that question, the booth questions, the booth layout, which is a big issue with the with the manufacturers, off the table as well. So I think good job. Good job by the IPCPR. Good job getting that off the table. We, we, the industry knows where they're going to be uh, in the next for the next three years. Great job there. Um, at the same time, um, the IPCPR has been without a CEO since like last fall when uh, they parted ways with Mark Purcell. Um, they have opted to bring in um, a um, a replacement. His name is Scott Pierce. He's going to get the title of executive director, which was an older title used for the head of IPCPR that, that kind of was that uh, the, the guy who ran the organization and reported into the board of directors. So there was a guy named Joe Rowe who had that title to 2011, and then uh, Bill Spahn came in, and he took over. Um, and Bill Spahn, he, was the, he got the title of CEO. Um, so he got the title of CEO. And then um, in 2014, 2013, Spahn and the IPCVR part ways. It wasn't a pretty separation, and they bring in Mark Purcell um, to be the CEO who served from 2014. Now, when you the CEO. Now, kind of looking at these hires, uh, Spahn was viewed upon as someone who was a little more of a Washington insider, and at the time, that people looked at him as the right hire. Um, what happened? From what I understand, they felt he didn't really have this, he couldn't stay in sync with the industry. I heard he didn't mesh well with the board. So Purcell comes in. Purcell comes in with his experience uh, of running trade shows in the Builders Association, which is a big trade show organization. Um, and uh, but he doesn't have the legislative experience. So that was always viewed. Mark, I think, was always viewed upon as being a weaker point in that one. I think Mark Purcell had a – again, he came in in 2014. His first trade show was a few weeks after getting the job. So you look at that, and then he has to preside over those three very difficult trade shows. Okay, probably not something he, if you know a, any CEO would want to go through. Those, those, the New Orleans mess, the malaise uh, following the deeming regulations, and then the move the following year. So – very difficult run Mark Purcell had, and but opted they opted not to continue. They bring in Scott Pierce. Um, now, from what I understand, Scott doesn't have the legislative background. He's not a cigar industry guy by any means. Um, but at the same time, I think they're bringing him in with a little different, a different angle. Um, they're bringing him for his association and nonprofit experience. Uh, they're bringing in him for his ability to generate revenue. Which is something the IPCPR has got to. If, if you look at, if you want to look at the trade show as a problem, I think there's a bigger underlying problem with the, um, with that part of IPCPR, which is the revenue generation, the membership, keeping the membership engaged. I think there's a lot of people questioning if if they should still be member. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on there right now. Uh, hey, look, they got the trade show back to the sands before Scott got hired, um, and uh, so I think that's a a good job by that. Um, they. They have some very good legislative people in IBC, Dan Troop and Rachel Hyde. Dan runs the federal affairs, and Rachel runs the state affairs. Very strong leadership on the legislative end. So I think they're they're well there. I think they're doing well there. And I and and um, as far as the trade show goes, Dawn Conger has been involved with that, and Dawn Conger gets promoted out of this whole thing. Dawn is a longtime IMB, IPCPR employee. She gets promoted to vice president of operations. I think everyone would say. You know, whether you're going to survive IPCPR, I think the one thing is Dawn worked hard, and, and, and Dawn was worthy of getting this operations role. So now she could kind of work alongside of, of, of Mr. Pierce, who's going to be focused, you know, obviously as executive director, and have that focus on the, the, the revenue and the generation. And Dawn can handle a lot of the operations because she understands how to run IPCPR. So I think this is a really, again, a good move going into the trade show. We'll see how it works um, ultimately. But I think it was a, I think it was a solid um, – I think it was a solid move there. I think they made a couple of solid moves uh, in the IPCPR uh, as far as both of these things go. So good job uh, by the IPCPR. We, we, we often, they often get beat up, I think, a little unfairly here.
Will Cooper, um, anyway, getting to the end of this installment of Prime Cuts, number 24, um, on the Primetime Show, we have episode 51 of the Primetime Show, and we will have, get this, um, put your seatbelts on, Steve Saka in the hot seat. You're not going to want to miss that. Primetime episode 51, May 3rd, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, anything can happen on primetime. Uh, the following week, we have primetime episode 52. We have Juan Lopez of Gurker. And I'm looking forward to having Juani on the show. Uh, Juan's a great guy. Um, and, you know, like I said, Gurker, I think there's there's some really good things. Some, there's a lot of good sometimes that gets gets forgotten about with Gurkha. So I think, and Juan's a great representative of the cigar industry. Looking forward to having him on. And then finally, uh, you'll hear it. You hear you hear, uh, breaking news on Cigar Coop. Uh, the special edition one year anniversary show has been confirmed. Ernesto Perez Carrillo Jr. will be our guest. Uh, he will be uh, doing. Uh, he will be on Monday, May twenty first, for the special edition one year anniversary show. Hard to believe it's one year old. We're really glad we nailed that one down. Uh, and uh, hopefully we, we had to reschedule Ernesto, so we're banking on Ernesto. If not, we'll ha- we'll do something. We'll have to do something topical tonight. But but Ernesto has been on a busy schedule, and we do appreciate the opportunity to reschedule him. Anyway, that's gonna wrap up Prime Cuts number twenty four for this May first, two thousand eighteen. If you're watching this live, we'll see you on Thursday night on Primetime episode fifty one. Take care, everybody.